All right, we're going to take a look at um, chapter six in this lesson, and chapter six deals with the analysis of independent two-group data, and specifically we're going to look at an example that uses the unpooled t-test. So here's our example right here. Um, below we have a random sample of test scores of males and females in an engineering class. They're listed right there. And really what we want to learn about is we want to see if there is statistical evidence to suggest that the males perform better than the females in this on this engineering test on average all right so um, we're going to use alpha equal 0.05 to help evaluate this claim so one of the things i think that's imp important to do first is to do some sort of um, real quick analysis of the data or kind of like a pre-analysis of the data to take a look at what the mean is and the standard deviation and some other stuff. So I, I already did that and sketched out a picture of the box plot as well. So um, group one, we have our males. We're going to assign uh, the males as group one. So the sample size is uh, nine. The mean for the males is 81.11. Um, and then the standard deviation is 13.31 approximately. And below there's roughly what the box plot looks like. And I got that from my calculator. So group two is um, the female group, and their sample size is seven. X bar uh, for the females, or the mean for the females, is 78.71. And then the standard deviation is about uh, 5.19. And then the box plot for the females is given below as well. And those are just rough sketches of what the box plots look like. So that gives us an idea what the data looks like. Now, our goal is to see if there's statistical evidence to say that uh, males perform better than females on average, okay? So that's the hypothesis uh, that we're going to kind of evaluate. But first, I want to talk about the assumptions or the conditions that have to be met in order to use this test. And there might be a couple other things that I'm going to just brush over, but we'll probably address some of that when we get back in class, okay? So uh, first thing uh, with our assumptions, all right, step one will be the assumptions and I'll have to slide this down just a little bit so we can see those alright so step one alright the first assumption is that we have a quantitative response variable for both groups Right? And I think it's very important to identify the quantitative response variables and what the groups represent and everything else, okay? So I kind of did this when I did the exploratory data analysis right above. Um, but what we should do is we, could, we should formally define those. So um, X1 represents the test scores of the males. All right, and then X2 represents the test scores of the females. And then I also think it's important to identify what the population means are going to represent. So mu sub 1 would represent the, um, the average test score for all males. And mu sub 2, similarly, would be the average test score for all females. And the goal is really to compare those two to see if the males perform better than the females on average. So we should identify what those are, so that gives us a healthy start. The next thing that we, we should uh, verify is whether or not randomization was used to gather the data. We've talked about this before, but that's a really important component that we need to verify or check. In our class, we typically just assume that, that that's true. So I'll, I'll just write this out, but randomization was used 
to gather data for both groups. So the groups are the, the males and the females when we, when we reference them in this case, okay? So let me flip the page and we'll get to the next assumption. And part of the reason why we wanna check for randomization is we're trying to avoid things like sampling bias, okay? So the third assumption has a couple parts to it. And this is a continuation of our assumptions. So um, the third assumption is this, is N1 greater than or equal to 30 and N2 greater than or equal to 30. All right, so what we're doing is we're making sure that the sample size is sufficiently large. Um, so that way, you know, things like outliers um, and skewness aren't really influencing one of those means significantly. And when we have a larger sample size, um, those things are influenced less. And we've discussed that a few times in class already. Uh, the answer to this is actually no. And two is actually equal to seven. So there's one other um, uh, kind of part of this condition that we can check and, and that has to deal with the, uh, the shape of the distribution. So the next question we generally ask ourselves is this, is the population distribution for both groups approximately normal. All right, so remember that's uh, looking to see if the, the distributions are symmetric, unimodal, and free of outliers are kind of the conditions that we look at um, to determine normality loosely in this situation right here, okay? There's other ways that we can do that, but um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the box plot and we'd want to do this for both the males and the females. The males are group one, the females are group two. And I'm just going to flip back to the previous page so we can take a look at those box plots. Um, and when we do that and we take a look at the box plots, these were sketched from uh, the output from my calculator. And you can see there's no outliers that are identified on there. Uh, the male's box plot is slightly left skewed. Um, you can kind of see that with the longer tail on the left hand side. Um, and then the female box plot, this one appears to be a little bit more symmetric. There, again, there's no outliers there. Uh, so for right now, for the purposes of class, we're going to say that, yeah, they appear to be approximately normal. There's nothing that really stands out that's uh, going to influence this. Now, you might want to um, test that a little bit more in detail um, if you're doing this in practice, okay? So once we check the conditions, remember the conditions are what helps us identify what type of test we're going to use. And by going through and doing this, this, this is really telling us that we can use um, the uh, independent samples t-test. Um, and we're going to be using an unpooled uh, variance when we go through and do this, okay? So step two is our hypothesis statement. And so our null hypothesis, h sub 0, and our alternative hypothesis, h sub a, one of those two will come from the claim. If you recall, the claim was that do males perform better than females on average, okay? So when we compare the males to females, the males were group 1, so we're comparing mu 1 to mu 2. And the word better than implies uh, strictly greater than. Do the males perform better than the females? So that's, that's going to be our alternative hypothesis. Now our null hypothesis could be one of two things. I like to use the complement rule when I do this. Um, it could be the males perform as good as the females, so there's no difference between the two. Mu1 equals mu2. But I'm going to say um, that the males perform um, at most as good as the females, all right? Just to stay in, in tune with kind of the, the complement rule when we go through and do this. So now I do have to note that uh, these hypothesis, hypothesis statements can be written a little bit differently, and I'm gonna write these off to the side in blue, but it would be mu1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to zero, okay? And then this one for the alternative would be mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. Depends on your textbook on how the hypothesis statement is written. 
Um, I usually just write them the way that you see right here in the black, but some texts will write it this way. And you'll see this a little bit more in step three. So hopefully at this step, you realize, or this stage of the game, you realize that we are doing um, the independent samples t-test, so we're using the t-distribution. So our picture looks something like this right here, right? And this is on the scale of t. And more specifically, if we look at the alternative hypothesis, the arrow is pointing to the right, so this is telling us we're doing a right tail test. So that's going to be where our alpha value falls, so that 0 0.05 falls in that tail right there. And that tail is the rejection region. So that alternative hypothesis is really important because it tells us where the alpha value goes, and it tells us that this is a uh, right tail test, and this is our reject H sub zero region. So if that's our reject H sub zero region, that means right here in this larger area is the fail to reject H sub zero region. Okay. All right. So that kind of sets us up and brings us to step number three. Um, once we once we've identified all that. So step three. We have our uh, level of significance. And then we have our test statistic slash p-value. Right. So our alpha value is 0 0.05. And that's all I'm going to write over on the level of significance side. Um, the next thing that we have to get is our test statistic, which I, I denote this um, maybe a little bit different than some other professors do. I use a star to indicate that that's the test statistic. Um, so our test statistic is this right here for the unpooled t-test. It would be x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 all over the square root of s sub 1 squared over n sub 1 plus s sub 2 squared over n sub 2. All right. It's called the unpooled test t-test because we're not pooling the variance of these two groups. Uh, we're using those two groups independently, okay, or evaluating those independently. So now, um, now it's really just kind of a plug and chug for this formula. Um, so our test statistic um, ends up being t star is equal to, in this case, x bar 1 was um, 81.11 for minus, you may be wondering, what is mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2? Well, if we look back up to our hypothesis statement, this is really saying mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 is greater than 0. Mu sub 1 minus mu, two, mu sub 2 is less than 0. So that value of the difference between these two uh, uh, population means is 0 right there. So down here in our test statistic in the numerator, this is really minus 0. Some texts don't include that statement in there, and they just have x bar 1 minus x bar 2. But I think it's really important to note that we're comparing a sample statistic to a population parameter in the numerator. And the bigger the difference between these two, the more likely we are to reject our null hypothesis. And the smaller the difference between these two, the less likely we are to reject our null hypothesis. Okay? So then in the denominator, this is going to be the square root of um, S sub 1 squared, which is 13.308. Uh, and we have to square that value divided by our sample size for group 1, which was 9, plus um, S sub 2 squared, which is 5.187 squared, divided by that group sample size, which happened to be 7. All right. And when you do the math, which you can do using your calculator, you get a test statistic um, of 0 0.494. Okay. And then uh, we use the test statistic to help us find our p-value, all right? So the p-value I denote as uh, p star. And we're going to use the tcdf function on our calculators. And if you recall, the inputs are our lower bound, comma, our upper bound, and then our degrees of freedom, okay?
So there's a number of different ways that you can get the degrees of freedom for an unpooled t-test, but let's focus on getting the lower bound and the upper bound first, okay? If you recall up here in our picture on the t distribution right there at the center is zero. So our test statistic t star is somewhere over here. I don't know whether it's over in the tail or over here, but it's on the left side. And since we're doing a right tail test, the shading for that p-value is going to be to the right. So the lower bound will be somewhere over here on the left and the upper bound will be infinity or something very large over here on the right. So the lower bound I'm going to use as 0 0.494. The upper bound, since we don't have an infinity button on our calculator, is going to be 1 million. And then we have to get our degrees of freedom. So we'll do that and we'll we'll talk about that in just a minute all right so i i'm going to use the calculator to get the degrees of freedom and you'll see that in another video after this but our degrees of freedom the formula is kind of messy for this um so it is s1 um squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2 that whole quantity squared all over S1 squared over N1 squared divided by N1 minus 1 plus S sub 2 squared over N sub 2 that whole quantity squared all over N2 minus 1. So um, what we're doing is we're weighting those respective uh, sample sizes and those degrees of freedom uh, in order to figure this out. And if you use your calculator, you'd find out that the degrees of freedom are equal to approximately 10.88. Um, so we're just going to round that up to 11. So our degrees of freedom are equal to 11. All right. This will introduce a little bit of rounding error, but it won't be significant. So over here in our, our TCDF function, we'll use the degrees of freedom equal to 11. Okay, um, and there's other ways certainly to get your degrees of freedom. Like some some texts will say use the minimum of uh, the degrees of freedom from group one and group two, whatever the minimum degrees of freedom are from those, and that's what you'd use to approximate that. Um, so it's up to whatever textbook you're using, but we're going to use use this method right here. So next we have our our p value. So we had plug this into our calculator. Um, and use the TCDF function, and we should come up with a p-value of approximately um, 0 0.3155. And just recall, the larger the p-value, um, the, the less likely we are to reject our null hypothesis, and the smaller the p-value, the more likely we are to reject our null hypothesis. Okay, So right now, um, that's what we have for our p-value, 0.3155, which is pretty large. So let's go ahead and move on to step four. We've got our test statistic. We've got our p-value. Um, step four is our decision rule. All right. So our decision rule is this right here. We always use a criteria for rejecting the null hypothesis. So we'd say if p star, our p value, is less than our alpha value, then reject the null hypothesis h sub 0. Okay, so that's our criteria for rejecting our null hypothesis. So now we want to make a statement about what we want to do in regards to our null hypothesis. So in this case right here, we'll say um, since our p-value is equal to 0 0.3155 is not less than our alpha value equal to 0 0.05, we will fail to reject h sub 0. So this just means that we don't have enough difference between the difference of the two sample means and the difference of the two population means to say um, that we should reject our null hypothesis. Okay, And then step 5 we want to write some sort of conclusion statement. Okay, So in step 5 for our conclusion, 
We already decided in step four what we're going to do in regards to h sub zero. We're going to fail to reject our null hypothesis. So um, step five, we want to write our conclusion kind of similar to what our claim was and state what we're going to do um, re regarding this. So I generally like to create kind of a, a blanket statement that we can use over and over again, which you've seen in class multiple times. We're going to say, um, for example, there is... blank sufficient evidence to support that blank on average in the population So generally, our form comes in the form of H sub A. Not every single time, but a, a good majority of the time it comes in the form of our alternative hypothesis. If you recall from that original statement, we said, uh, um, do males perform better than females on average? That's what H sub A represented in words. So um, you could take that and you could type that in here, um, uh, or write that in here, not type it in here, but uh, males perform better than females on engineering tests on average in the population. So um, I always ask myself, at least when I was an intro stat student, I would say, you know, um, is this true or is this not true? Uh, males perform better than females on average um, is there evidence to suggest that uh, males perform better than females? Well, we failed to reject our null hypothesis, meaning there's not enough evidence to reject that in favor of our alternative hypothesis, which was this statement right here. So there is not sufficient evidence to support that males perform better than females on engineering tests on average in the population. So this will give you kind of a brief um, overview of the five-step process for hypothesis testing for two independent samples when we're dealing with quantitative data. Um, hopefully this will help you navigate your homework and um, other stuff in the class.